Well, while uh, Joe is working on some of this technology here, and it may take us a minute, um, we've talked a little bit about the avenues in which um, the ALS Association and you support ALS research um, through uh, public policy as well as direct funding of, of clinical trials and basic science research. Um, I mentioned a little bit about the um, public policy efforts for funding the ALS registry. Well, there's another public policy initiative that the ALS community has been a large part of, which is the ALS research program at the Department of Defense. And every year as part of the public policy priorities for the ALS Association and the ALS community, we are also up in Congress um, lobbying for direct research dollars from the Department of Defense in no small part because of the higher um, uh, level of, of uh, prevalence in ALS for, for people who have served in the U.S. Armed Forces and, and our, vet, our veterans. Um, and it's exciting because that's a novel program that takes risks and tries to fund um, uh, uh, research, program, research efforts that uh, are promising but maybe a little bit riskier. And I'm also proud to share that because of those efforts, um, besides the association funding from our chapter for Dr. Beckman, he's also a, a past recipient of this ALS research program funding through the Department of Defense, which happens only because of the public policy initiative and efforts of people living with ALS. So really, a lot of the support that's, that's channeling into our community looking at basic science research comes from the efforts that you put forward. So we want to thank you for that. And we're really thrilled today to have Dr. Beckman with us. Um, he's a regular speaker at this event. And he also is um, just a great colleague and a great uh, person in support of families and individuals living with ALS. He has a very open uh, policy to um, connect with people and answer their questions and give support um, for people and encouraging people to, to gain knowledge about ALS and the therapies that may be coming down the, the line. He's a, a uh, endowed chair or endowed uh, uh, chair of, uh, faculty position at, with the Linus Pauling Institute at Oregon State University. And whenever I get a chance to make it to Corvallis, I go and visit Joe in his office and his lab. And he is actually in the ALS building at Oregon State University. However, it's Ag Life Sciences, not, not ALS. So um, welcome, uh, Dr. Joe Beckman. So thanks very much for having me back. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to come here. And even though I've been coming back from year to year, I think I have a couple of new twists on stories that I didn't anticipate. Um, and it actually has something to do, I'm thinking about it because of both it. Hurricane Iris, but last year I was invited to the ALS Association meeting that was down in Florida, and I wasn't sure we were going to be able to make it there in October because there was a hurricane blowing through and managed to land in the tailwinds. And in there, I suddenly realized that there's actually real progress coming with patients. And it wasn't that I'm just working in an academic lab, but a number of things actually look like they're actually turning out to work in patients, which is exciting, certainly exciting for you, um, and really exciting for me. And I'll try to tell you more of that story today. Um, I love being in Oregon. I love Whitewater Rivers. I was really torn about going to that meeting because I usually go down the Rogue River whitewater rafting that weekend. And so it turned out it was good karma, I guess, from uh, not going on the rafting trip. So I'd like to uh, start off by acknowledging the CDMRP is that Department of Defense funding, which was very generous and that actually really boosted my lab. And it's actually allowed us to do, uh, develop a new drug for ALS. that We just filed a patent on it. Now you'll be the first group that I actually present some of that work with. And I've talked to you before about the copper ATSM, this drug that was developed in Australia. And uh, I want to point out that it's under clinical trials now in Australia. The results will be presented in December, but it's only a phase one trial for safety. And it looks like it's safe, which is actually a, a really big thing. Um, 
and that it isn't something that my lab developed. It was Kevin Barnum realized this. Paul Donnelly was the chemist that made it. And Ashley Bush uh, was really working and getting a company to pick it up. And Blaine Roberts was a PhD student in my lab who went to Australia a decade ago. And he's working with Peter Crouch on testing the results. And so he brought back this idea of testing this compound to our lab. He's actually visiting right now, so he's working with four or five people in the lab, and it's, we founded a company that has very little to do with ALS, but it has a lot to do with biomarker discovery, because that is so critical, as Jill pointed out, and it's really the limitation, okay? And I'll try to explain a little bit more about how hard it is to get a drug and get people excited about it. Um, and let's see. The other thing is it's a conflict of interest. I just have to let you know I have a company that does mass spec work. It's not directly related to this. But also I'm a scientific consultant for this company, CMD, that's actually testing uh, copper ATSM right now. So I also want to start out by, uh, I actually heard the country Uruguay just mentioned by Paul. Uh, but I've had a 25-year um, friendship and collaboration with people from there. So uh, Luis Barbado is working very hard, and there's a drug called mastinibid that he's the real leader in developing. We actually have, it's a drug that actually doesn't get a lot of uh, recognition. In fact, when it succeeded in phase three trials, it's the only time I've seen a company stock go down when it succeeded in a trial, okay? But we have two papers that are coming out on this, and we have uh, several others, but I'm really excited about how it affects the neuromuscular junction and the wasting of muscles. And it's the first indication that mast cells, which are cells that, you know, when you take antihistamines, that's what they're hitting, is involved in ALS. And Alvaro Estevez I've collaborated with for many years, and he's back actually in Corvallis, and we're collaborating there as well. And Patricia Casina uh, is also a really important collaborator. And there were things that we did 10 years ago that suddenly came back to me when we were down in Orlando. I'm sorry, down in Tampa last year. Oh my gosh, it's all the pieces are beginning to fit together. Okay, so I like to show this picture of South America and where Uruguay is. And where we were sitting right here, or standing, is on this very flat part. It's the only place where you can watch the sun rise and go sink uh, set over the Atlantic because it sticks out in a little spit of land. So it's a really pretty spot, a great country. Um, and then the other collaborators are in Australia. And when I was presenting down there earlier this year, I found this slide. I was going to show a picture of Australia upside down, but this is much more fun. <laughs> okay? So there's Tasmania about to be gobbled up by Australia. Whoops. And then you also have a schnauzer's head. Okay? So I can't look at Australia the same way anymore. Okay, I gave a talk this summer and uh, I put this slide together, so I was amazed this is on the brochure out front. Uh, but a very famous scientist said, well, I heard that ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig didn't have ALS because he was so young. So it turns out that's not true. And I've actually been really startled at how many people, uh, young people, are affected by the disease. Um, and Paul's right that we actually know very little about the disease. I also wanted to give one more call out, and that is the importance of this kind of research, because I didn't know anybody who had ALS, and I have no interest in the disease. But I was working on a particular protein, and in 1993, very early studies that were being done in ALS that everybody said, it's ridiculous, you'll never get anywhere with this. They succeeded and suddenly, the thing I was studying turned out to be the only known cause of ALS. So that's how I got involved in the, the field. And that's why it's really important. There's so, so much more to be brought in in so many other fields in this collaboration. This idea of working with people all around the world is so critical to really solving the problem, okay? Um, so I like this slide too, with the following the white water theme. And I found it on the web and I can't remember where. And 
this has happened to me several times in whitewater rafting of just leading the team against a very hard rock. And I don't agree with what they say at the bottom is, you know, so it could be that you don't have the right team, but sometimes the problem's really hard, and ALS is a really hard problem to crack. But I'm also pretty boneheaded, and I kind of believe that if you keep hammering your head against the wall, sometimes you can move the wall. Okay? So part of the reason why it's such a brick wall is it's a really complex disease. We know that it involves something called motor neurons that are in your spinal cord to simplify this. But around it, there are astrocytes and there's inflammatory cells that are called microglia. I want you to remember this star-shaped cell because I'll show you one picture later. It's just really pretty. Um, and then the other thing that's involved in a major way that we often forget about in the disease is the muscle. And, you know, so there's this hand shaking and there's a, th at least four other cell types that are involved in it. And so it's sorting through this process and figuring out where things are going wrong is hugely, is a huge challenge. And really the only way you can do that is you need a clue as to what's broken to start to figure out how you can go about unraveling where things went wrong. And that's what's been going on for the past 25 years. We now have 30 things that we know that if they're broken, you can get the disease. So in 2014, the ice bucket challenge hit, and um, it was a phenomenal opportunity. So this is Ed Ray, the president of the university. And these are, uh, Pam just finished her PhD in my lab, and she's actually developed a fifth drug that we're testing for ALS and they're about to dump ice on the president of the university, which is a rare opportunity. <laughs> and uh, faculty dream about these things. But, <laughs> but uh, I also have to say, I don't really, um, I don't, um, what's the right word? The job that Jill and Lucy Brun have is extraordinarily tough, and it was actually made harder by the disease because everybody fell into this. They said, oh, we're gonna give a lot of money to ALS. Go cure it, okay? And they raised 140 million, which sounds like a lot of money, but a single clinical trial will cost more than $100 million. And there's so many ways to go wrong, and it's basically hitting a rock hard as to how you move forward. But there are lots of ways to do it. And one of the things to keep in mind about this money, what makes it so valuable is it's early money and you can take risks with it. The Department of Defense is great, but I actually almost triggered a congressional defense uh, investigation because I had three undergraduates that helped out in the lab and I didn't send the right notification through three levels back to them. Every dollar I had to justify on how it's spending. And that's really hard to take risks and to actually find the way that you advance. So this is early money, a seed money that's so critical for it, and it's helping in many different directions, okay? So I actually didn't know about the ice bucket when it was um, happening. My wife showed me a picture of my daughter in a bikini having ice dumped overhead, and that was how I learned about it. But I had two parents that were in the intensive care units and was completely absorbed with that. But the other part of it was, at the same time, we had a breakthrough that we were working on. We had it for a year and a half because I know nobody would believe what we were doing. And I'll show you what it is. I've shown this movie before. Um, so these are mice that are still walking around. So over here, there's three mice that carry a gene that causes ALS. They should have been dead 120 days, and they look normal at 400 days. But they actually do get ALS, and you can see that they're actually, some of the hind limbs are sticking out on the mice over here. Um, can you see the pointer when I move it around? Okay. And that's a phenomenal result, and I'll come back to that, but it was really exciting, but it's mice. And, you know, is this actually ever going to translate into humans, and then how do you get anybody to believe it? Uh, and the compound that we were using is also one that seems totally crazy to use. Um, so to give you an idea, to make it, you take the smell of popcorn butter, 
you mix it with the, the chemical that killed all the people in Bhopal, India, plus rocket fuel, boil it in wood alcohol, and then you add a pesticide that's approved for organic pesticides, and then you end up with an orange brick dust that seems to have this miraculous effect, okay? So my lab could get really exciting if we screw up. Uh, and it really came about from working on some high technology, but this is uh, the day, we, this is Blaine Roberts and Nathan Lopez, and they're working in the lab right now. And we were doing measurements, and we realized there was a problem with copper in the brain and with the enzyme that caused it, and he told me about this compound they were working on. Actually, he told me about it two years before, but I ignored it, to be honest. And that's what we're testing. But what I've realized is there's actually several other drugs. So we were also doing studies with mastinibid, which now works in a phase three trial that hopefully will go forward. And it's working more on the neuromuscular junction in uh, muscle degeneration. And then there's Radicava, which is also known as a Daravon. And this is the one I learned about while I was visiting in Tampa, that I wasn't working on it. And I looked at the structure and said, why in the hell would that work? And I realized it looks very much like urate, which is also being tested in clinical trials. And so I'm going to explain some nerdy science later. But it's actually something that, a problem we've been working on for 25 years. It's how I got involved in ALS. And actually, I think I understand why a Daravon works. And that's really important because it's actually not known. And that's why it's not a very good drug. Okay, so a typical way a scientist or scientists start to uh, try to understand something like ALS or Alzheimer's or cancer is you have your genes and you have your environment and you look at the intersection between them. This is a large part of what that database will help do better. And then you start to understand risk factors uh, that will cause these diseases and that gives you a clue of where to look. But I really believe there's a really big thing that's missing here. And that is that, you know, what really kills people? So I like to, I teach a course in medicine, like their medicine, and I start off with these questions of what kills most of the people in the 20th century? And it turns out it's nothing on this list by a long shot. But these are actually the bigger killers, and smallpox, which no longer exists, we hope, um, actually killed three times more people than died in all the world wars and from these other causes, okay? And if you look at the, what's going on in the right-hand side here is these are infectious diseases. Another interesting statistic that came out actually from the CDC is what's the most dangerous animal in the world? Any ideas? Mosquitoes, yeah. Yellow fever. That actually wiped out a large number of my ancestors. So I really like this book that's written by an author down in Eugene, and someone last year uh, is related to Thomas Hager. Uh, but this is really about the development of sulfa drugs, and, which happened between World War I and World War II. But a key part of it is how the FDA got its teeth. And it actually is about how medicine got started and how drug discovery got started. So it's really a, a great read. There's, I've read it seven times now. And I keep pulling out more things. Um, but behind it is the basis of what makes us, what's so important about ALS. And this is a Time Magazine article from maybe a decade ago, and it's about inflammation. It's about how the body responds to being infected, okay? And a couple of things is, you know, how does a stubbed toe increase your chance of developing Alzheimer's or a heart attack or colon cancer? And this is the key part. Inflammation is important for clearing away infections, but it also does a lot of damage to the body. And I firmly believe that a major part of ALS is related to neuroinflammation, a process that's trying to fight off an infection, even if there really isn't an infection there. Okay, and we can talk more about that later if you like. So if we go back to this slide, the thing that's missing here is inflammation. How does the body respond? What is your history? And there's a process of what gets it started. How do you uh, kill pathogens without causing collateral damage? But you do cause collateral damage. 
and then wound healing, how do things recover? So if you use this perspective for understanding ALS, it actually changes the dynamic of what the disease looks like. And the different drugs all fit in blocking parts of these pathways. So we have two cells that you probably don't pay much attention to. One is the neutrophil, and that's the green color in pus, uh, or gas gangrene, but it's a cell that migrates throughout the body, and the other is called macrophages. And we don't pay much attention because there's not really a specific organ, organ for them. But if you put them all together, they would actually fill a shoebox. So they would take more space than the liver, which is the largest organ in the body. But they're distributed throughout the tissue. They're crawling around all the time and measuring different pathogens, trying to see, are you being infected or is, do you have a tumor happening? And that's been a real advance in medicine, including cancer, for understanding this process and how do you activate it. Now, one of the things about these cells is they're known to activate oxygen. So another thing that becomes interesting is the most toxic molecule in the, the environment is probably oxygen, what you need to breathe. And the reason is it produces free radicals like superoxide. And this is where I got my scientific start. I've been studying how are free radicals toxic. And this is Erwin Friedovich and Joe McCord who discovered an enzyme superoxide dismutase by doing purely very eclectic basic research that everybody said, get off this line of research, it's going to get you nowhere. Well, they discovered an enzyme that's a major defense against oxygen radicals. And this is the enzyme that's the second most abundant cause of ALS. And the paradox is, well, how the hell does that happen? So I was using this enzyme, actually, as a way to protect against stroke. And so these are dead brain tissues in a rat brain. And we could really protect uh, the brain by giving superoxide dismutase. And I actually got it through in the FDA, and we're just testing it in head trauma. But it actually could make things worse. And then I was sitting there and trying to understand what's going on, and suddenly this enzyme was linked to ALS in 1993, and it was a complete change in research and direction that has got me into this field. So I'm going to skip over this, except to say that there's some chemistry in here that's really subtle, and most people don't pay much attention to it, and I published a lot of papers on it. But Adarifon is probably working on something called tyrosine radical. And we'll come back to that, but there's a lot of implications for this as to why it would work in ALS. I think that's actually, even though it's not a very good ALS drug, um, it's going to tell us a way that we can do things a lot better. Okay? So there are lucky accidents in the lab, and there was one night where I added an oxidant to a superoxide dismutase, and the protein turned yellow. And I wasn't a very good analytical chemist, but I played soccer with a guy who was an x-ray crystallographer. And I got him to test this out, why my protein turned yellow. And he found an increase of electron density near tyrosine, and that was how he discovered nitrotyrosine. This is 25 years ago, uh, and this is the chemical structure of it. But it becomes a really good marker of disease in humans. So this is COPD, and these are controls to show that it really is specific binding. We, we show it in almost any human disease you want to look at, actually every human disease. There's a huge amount of nitration, and it correlates very precisely with where injury is occurring. And one of the curious things is SOD catalyzes tyrosine nitration. So in 1993, when mutations were discovered to cause ALS, that was a change in disease. And it's still a huge mystery. In fact, people are kind of giving up on SOD as a understanding how it causes ALS. Um, and if you think about it, here's an enzyme that's in every cell of your body from birth, and you can get the disease when you're 80 years old. And so how does that happen in a very tiny fraction of cells? And the cells that are affected are motor neurons that are in the spinal cord, and there are also some neurons, motor neurons in the upper cortex that feed down. And the remarkable thing is you only have 200,000 motor, neuron, 200, motor neurons when you're born. That's all you've got to control the movement of every voluntary muscle in your body, and in this disease, they're dying one after the other. 
So we're trying to understand the process of that. And I think we've made enormous progress in the past 20 years doing it. And this is just showing the motor neurons that are present uh, in the spinal cord. And this was actually done in 1994 uh, at Harvard, but that's showing nitrotyrosine in motor neurons, but also in the outlying tissues. And this is a patient that died of heart disease without the nitration. So it was a key marker for neuroinflammation, and we've been tracking down for all these years, how does that actually relate to the disease? So we have uh, an enzyme that causes the disease that's discovered by a genetic search, and now you can take that piece of DNA that you saw uh, earlier, cut it out, and you can put it into a mouse, or a rat, or a pig, or a zebrafish, or fruit flies, or even C. elegans, which I actually worked on 40 years ago, uh, that suddenly all these animals get the, the human disease. Dogs have a form of progressive paralysis, and it turns out they have a spontaneous mutation in SOD. <clears throat> and, but it has to be homozygous. You have to have two copies that cause the disease. Okay. So it's rather miraculous. We have good models of ALS that are caused by taking a single gene from humans that causes the disease. And yet, after 25 years, we still don't understand why that happens. And so even though the phenotype is robust, you know, you are getting disease, the model's really found out of, fallen out of uh, favor. And this kind of explains part of it. So here's the model of ALS, and then over here are days. So these mice will carry the SOD gene, and they'll make it out to about 100 days, and they start to lose weight. And by 115 to 130 days, they die. If you search the web, that's the only photograph any of us can find that people will acknowledge of what it looks like when a mouse gets ALS. But you can see the hind muscles have degenerated, the legs are dropping, uh, the back is hunched because they've lost this muscle up here, and it's progressing, the upper, the upper paws will be affected if they keep going. Okay? So in three weeks, these mice actually go from looking like this to that. In rats, it's 10 days. It's a phenomenal progression, okay? And over here is, uh, people have been trying, thousands of labs have tried many, many compounds to treat the disease. And this was one uh, drug, an antibiotic, that caused a very slight increase in survival. And this went on to a $20 million trial. And you can see that there was a benefit at the median of survival, but in the end, they all died of the disease. And the drug didn't work in humans, so what was wrong? It's the mouse model. Because um, certainly the clinician that initiated this can't be wrong. So here we were testing copper ATSM in the same model. And there's a, there was a million dollar prize offered if you could extend life by 25%. Okay? So we made the compound. We were trying to figure out how to give it. And it turns out that it will go... If you dissolve it in DMSO, it'll go straight through the skin. So it's really easy to apply. That's not a drop of blood on a mouse. Here the skin turns red, and 15 minutes later, it's already in the tissues, and it's getting into the brain. And we actually got pretty phenomenal survival increases. Um, so when I first presented this at an ALS meeting, uh, people were really excited. I called Bob Brown, a neurologist in Boston, about it, and I was afraid he was going to have an accident on I-93. You got a 25% extension of life in these mice. But I was trying to tell him this isn't what's really exciting, okay? That we could actually cure the mice, but I cheated, okay? Um, oh, because we're giving an orange color, um, we also had a problem that you want to keep everything blinded and randomized, but the skins turn yellow, and you can see it on the fur. So when we were evaluating the mice, Nathan Lopez, who was in an earlier photograph, found he had red laser goggles, safety glasses. And so this is the ultimate blinded experiment, right? But if you look through it, you can see that they're bright orange, and you can't tell if we've given them the compound or not. Um, so we did this study very carefully, and it actually took two years. Lance and some of the people in the association actually saw some of the mice down in Corvallis. 
But here's the problem why randomization is so important. So this was a study by the ALS Therapy Development Foundation in Boston. They raise a lot of money. They, raise, they test drug after drug in mice. They have never repeated a single study. So these cyan blue-green bars are results where people pr reported protection in mice. And they simply used larger numbers of mice um, and <clears throat> a standardized protocol and very careful control of the genetics. And they could get reproduced no single finding. Okay. So I wasn't too worried about copper ATSM because Peter Crouch in Australia did the same study and he used a dose of 50 milligrams. I used 100. We, uh, there's a large team doing this. We could line it up and we tried to publish this in a dose response curve with two points and a control and the reviewer said, ah, you can't do that. You need more points. But the point is we both got protection at opposite ends of the world, okay? So um, what was fun was at this meeting down in Tampa, um, Steve Perrin, the head of the ALS TDI, came up and said, congratulations, Joe. And I'm kind of thinking, what's going on here? And he says, so I said, thank you, and you know, turned to get more food. And he said, well, I haven't told you why. He said, yours is the first compound we've ever repeated, okay? So they did the study, and we can plot their point here, okay? So we actually have three different groups doing it, and we have a linear dose response with the drug, okay? So that's exciting, but to be honest, all the mice died, and it was only an extension of 40 days. They did better. But really, when I did the study, it was a control group for another study. So we're all trying to cure the disease. And so you want to go see, can I make things better? But sometimes the better way to look at it is, how can I break it? How can I make it happen more fast? Or what breaks it? And that's what we were studying. And there was a paper that came out before by a group in Texas that said the copper chaperone for SOD, if you put it in with SOD, I'll show you a picture of it, the animals die eight times faster. And so this is a protein that helps put copper into superoxide dismutase and helps it fold together. So it should help ben benefit, instead it makes things much worse. And so that's what we were really studying. And so here's the mice that die um, within two to three weeks if they have two genes that are present in humans and are untreated. And I'll just show you the, the overall part of it. The mice I showed you at the early part of this went out for two years. Okay, and they died of a much milder form of ALS. So just giving this drug continuously protected them. We had to give it to them, the drug to them when the mice were young to keep them alive because they needed copper. But if we took the drug away, they died, and we could rescue them and restore the drug and keep them alive for a year. Okay? So we have a mouse model that we could effectively treat, but we broke the rules. We weren't using the one mouse model that everybody uses, and so Nobody really, a lot of people are really skeptical about this. And to my knowledge, nobody's tried to repeat this particular experiment. Um, so <clears throat> fortunately, um, a group has picked it up. The safety studies are underway. The drug does seem to be safe in humans. And we'll know more results in uh, December as to how well it works. So I've taken my nice sweet lab in Corvallis and all the undergrads into it and I've turned them into drug makers. Um, and we're making lots of different variations of it. This is what we're using the Department of Defense money. And as you can see, we've managed to make every color in the Pac-12 football uh, arena. So, you know, we got the, the Ducks orange and we got the Wazoo red and of course Copper ATSM is OSU's orange color. So we're excited about that. As I mentioned, you start making this with the smell of popcorn butter. After two years of work, we've got a drug that works better. And what we've done is we've changed this group and we made it a phenyl group. And it turns out the starting material for this is not the smell of popcorn butter, but the smell of coffee. So we have a true Northwest solution here. <laughs> okay, so I'm pretty excited about that. We'll see how it goes. And these are just different uh, 
examples of data generated showing that it's restoring things in the brain. It actually helps SOD mature better. The antisense is trying to get rid of SOD. We're stabilizing it. And uh, that seems to work really well. Last part, I'm probably running long, long. I haven't paid attention to this, but I did mention Adaravon and Radicava and what it's doing. So when I started to look at it, I realized what I've been studying for 25 years and got tenure in a, uh, for, I hadn't been thinking about it right. So this is a protein that's called heat shock protein 90. We've shown it's involved in ALS. And this red here is a tyrosine. And if you add three atoms to it, it becomes nitrotyrosine and it kills motor neurons. And you don't have to do anything else to induce this long death cascade. And what's happening is an intermediate's formed. We basically are taking an electron away inside of this. And so what we're exploring now is two drugs that are actually in development, Adaravon and Urate, actually work at donating an electron to repair a tyrosine radical. Why is that important? No one really knows how a Darabon works. It doesn't have a target or a drug. And you heard about biomarkers and how do you make the drug more effective. Now I've got a handle that we can go through and ask, do derivatives work better? How much do you need to get in there? And we can assess directly how it's working. So another group of undergraduates are busy making another series of drugs of variations of a Darabon, which turns out to be one of the easiest drugs to make and it turns out copper ATSM can, has this activity. I don't think that's how it's working in vivo, but it's one of those surprising things. You never know uh, all the controls where they're going. And I mentioned the star-shaped cells earlier. This was just showing work we had done quite a while ago of showing the process of nitration, things that a Darabon goes, and urate protects against this process that's actually, we've shown is involved in driving the death of one motor neuron after another why the disease progresses. And that's a key part of what we're looking for in this, is we can't restore a motor neuron, but we want to stop the progression by one motor neuron after another uh, dies. So we can't cure the disease, but the hope and the prayer is that when you're noticing that your hand is getting weak, that you could actually slow the disease down so that that becomes the limitation. It's no longer a death sentence becomes more like living with post-polio syndrome, which has got severe problems, but it is something that people manage to live with. So to summarize, inflammation and oxidative stress. Host defense has really driven our evolution, and I think ALS is a host defense disease. It's more the fear of the disease that's driving it. I, for the first time, I have real hope that there's a lot of ways that are coming together to treat the disease from many different angles, and it's starting to, to make sense. And there's new tools for evaluating it. The biomarkers are so key. There's new drugs, new approaches, and they were protecting better than I ever dared uh, hope before, and that's nothing, not something I'd say in front of a group like this easily because hope is really what you're hanging on to. But it's possible that we can do far better. And so I want to come back to this of, you know, banging your head against the wall and trying over and over again and really try to explain why do basic research? Why is it so important? So this is Blossom Bar. It's a rapid on the Rogue River in southern Oregon. It actually has the most deaths of any river, uh, and it was impassable until someone blew a little tiny hole up here. And there is a way through all these rocks that you meander back and forth. And it's also my favorite place to go whitewater rafting. Um, but <clears throat> this is what basic research does. You can bang your head against a wall and you're not going to get through it. But we find so many different angles and twists that you can start to go in different directions and figure out when to go left, when to go right, and just how far and how hard. And so there's not going to be one drug that cures the disease. There's a whole host of things that come together and it's going to be a process of managing the disease. Um, but we now have the pieces to be able to figure out the path through that. And that's why, how you can get through something that looks like it's impossible to get through. And there are a whole long list of people that have been involved in this for many years. And it's been really gratifying that people that worked with me many years ago, they're still working on this at their own laboratories. 
uh, one of which was one of the postdoctoral fellows that Jill mentioned earlier. So I'll be happy to answer questions.